G'day, I'm Dr. Kev, and in this video we're going to be looking at the speed and acceleration of sports cars since 1950. Welcome to Car Design Workshop. This work is part of the market research phase of the total design process. We're going to create a data set of cars that collects a number of different parameters. Uh, this will include things like the year of manufacture, how powerful a vehicle is, uh, how is the engine arranged, what are the dimensions of the car, the length, the width, the height and the weight. And have a look at a couple of performance parameters such as the 0 to 100 km an hour time or the top speed of the vehicle. Some of these parameters are quite easy to find. They're generally advertised by the manufacturers or collected by different data sources. Now I didn't want to analyse all vehicles out there, so I started looking through lists of cars where people would say these are the best sports cars from around 1950. I mainly focused on the base models of these sports cars with the assumption that if the base model is engaging and exciting, then adding power, adding performance is something that can always be done afterwards. Now once we have these cars, what we can do is create a correlation plot. And this is something that looks for parameters that correlate with each other. So that if we see a change either up or down in one parameter, we see another parameter change. Now we need to be careful that we don't confuse correlation with causation. For example, we might see that a lot of Ferraris have V12s, but it doesn't mean that V12s cause cars to be red and Italian much to the disappointment of many Jaguar XJS owners. And this data is going to help us determine what we might be looking for in the weight, power and speed of a vehicle. For example, something that is considered quite important for this vehicle will be its acceleration capability. So we can see in this graph uh, the acceleration time from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour versus the year. And we see that over time, uh, cars are improving. We see an increase in the acceleration capabilities of vehicles versus time. So we have a look at what's most important in the 0 to 100 time according to the correlation plot and we see that it is power. Surprisingly weight is quite a bit down the list. So let's have a look at this. In this graph we see the 0 to 100 time versus power. We can clearly see that as power is increasing, the 0 to 100 time decreases. Now it's relatively clear that this is not a linear relationship and there are diminishing returns as the power continues to increase. If we have a look at power versus time, we see that it's not a very strong correlation. It does look like that there is more possibility to make power as time goes on and this could be explained by general engineering advances. This could mean that a similar V8 sized engine today would produce a lot more power than a, the same engine size from the 1950s, but it also allows the possibility of lighter engines being used today for similar power that you would have got from the larger engines back in the 1950s. Now if we have a look at the 0 to 100 time versus weight, we surprisingly see not a strong correlation here. It looks like we can hit a, say, a target of under 6 seconds to 100 at any weight from about 500 to 1800 kilograms. And this highlights that there's multiple ways to get this acceleration time. We could have a high-powered heavy car, or we could have a lightweight car with less power. And this is where we'd really want to look at this relationship of the 0 to 100 time as power to weight. Here we see a very strong correlation between these parameters. More than that, we can get an idea of the power to weight required to hit a certain target. Now we can see that if we want to reliably hit a 0 to 100 time of under uh, 5 seconds, we would need a power to weight ratio of at least 0.15 kilowatts per kilogram and likely anywhere up to about 0.2 to 0.25. Now we notice that this shape is definitely a non-linear shape, and we can start to see some of the physics that are, is involved here. 
if we have a look at a traction curve and the, an acceleration event, there's two major phases. The first phase is where the car is limited by its tyre grip. And the second phase is where the car is limited by power. So I think that means from the point of building an engaging car, we're going to want a vehicle that is in this region of crossover between increasing power, uh, providing a big increase to zero to 100 kilometers an hour, and a vehicle that is, hasn't got too much grip. So you can have that case where the, the car can let go and that you may have to control it. So that tells us a little bit about the acceleration of a vehicle and now we can have a look at the top speed of the vehicle. Now this is a lot less important I think because if we look at the top speed versus year all of these cars are capable of reasonable top speeds far more than we can do on your average road. Now the number one parameter that relates to top speed is power and there's a very strong relationship here. As we increase power, we increase top speed. Now we would note the equation for power is equal to a force times a velocity. And the force in this case that's trying to slow the vehicle down will be the drag force, which is proportional to velocity squared. So we would expect that the top speed versus power will actually be related by a cube root. We'll have a look at this in a minute. But before, let's have a look at something that we show a very poor correlation for, and that would be top speed versus weight. Now, if we look at this plot, it just looks like the dots are randomly placed. And this means that the weight of a car is not going to be a good indication of its top speed. And in a very extreme case, if we look at land speed record cars, they're actually quite heavy. It's the power that has a big influence, not the weight of the vehicle. Now, some of these vehicles, we did have a drag coefficient. And if we look at the top speed versus drag, we do see a correlation here. There is a relationship. What would be interesting is if we can see if this relationship holds true to physics. The equation for the drag force is a half rho, which is the air density, times the coefficient of drag, times frontal area, times velocity squared. And as we mentioned before, power is equal to that force times velocity. So for these points, if we take that equation for calculated power, which would be a half rho CDA V cubed, and plot it versus power, we see a very clear linear relationship. Now we do see some error that doesn't follow this clear linear relationship, and some of that will be most likely due to misreporting of a drag coefficient or the power number for a vehicle. Now that we've seen that the power is so important to both the acceleration and top speed of a vehicle, it would be good for, of us to ask, what is it that makes an engine powerful? And the strongest correlation we see here is with engine capacity. Now it's worth noting here that there's quite a large spread of power versus capacity here, and that really can be taken into account that some of these cars have turbochargers and some of them don't. Some of these engines will have a higher rev limit and some of them don't. And we're not really capturing uh, which cars have turbochargers and which ones have been designed to rev really fast. In this graph, we do see a clear outlier with an engine size of eight liters. And this is our friend, the Dodge Viper where even though the engine is quite large, we don't see that the power is quite as high as we would expect. Now we see this colored by the year, and we see that the engine development over time has caused engines to be more powerful. If we just looked at one particular line and say the two liter region, we can see that in earlier times, in, a, in the 1960s, we would expect a two liter engine to provide about 100 kilowatts. And now as we get closer to 2020, we see the same size engine reliably producing above 200 kilowatts. Now we are taking this data from sports cars. So these are a pretty good indication of a well-tuned, well-developed engine of that size. Now another important question we can ask of this data 
is what is it that makes a car heavy? Now, we often hear that cars are getting heavier over time. And so let's just plot these as the weight versus time. And we see here that it's not actually a strong correlation. It appears that we could make light cars in every era. We do actually see that the lighter cars do get lighter over time. But there is quite a lot of spread here. As time has gone on, engines are more powerful. And so it makes it possible to have sporty cars, at least cars with high 0 to 100 times, at a higher weight. And this does offset the weight reduction we would expect because of improved manufacturing and improved materials. So here it shows that the, the year that a car built is not a really good indicator of the weight of the vehicle. It's interesting to ask what is. And what we see if we go down the list of things related to weight is the number one correlation is actually to the length of the car. Following that, we see the engine. So engine power and engine size. So the size of the engine and the weight of the engine would be a good indicator of the weight of the vehicle. And then we see width. So the top correlations to weight really involve the dimensions of the car and the size and power of the engine. So this is the graph showing the weight versus length of the vehicle. And we can clearly see here that as the length of the car increases, the weight of the vehicle increases. So car size is going to be a big driver of vehicle weight. Now, as we go down the list, we do see that torque is more closely related to vehicle weight than power. Now, we do know that if we look at just a naturally aspirated engine, the two main ways we're going to improve power is by increasing the engine volume, which generally increases the engine uh, size and weight, or by allowing that engine to rev higher. Now, a high revving engine generally will have a lower weight because in order to get those uh, revs, you need to reduce your rotating masses. But it's the engine that has the greater volume that is likely to have the greatest torque. So we do see that weight is closely related to the engine torque. Now, this is where we do need to be careful about the idea of correlation versus causation. Is it that the car is heavy because it has a heavy engine or does it have a heavy engine and a powerful engine because the designers are trying to ensure that it has good performance despite the vehicle's weight? Now, while we didn't see a close correlation between weight and year, it might be better to use a different set of data to explore that. Now, one company that has reliably made cars and sports cars of a very similar nature through a very long period would be Porsche. So I created a separate data set just looking at really the naturally aspirated Porsches from about the 1950s through to the common day. And I'm not looking at the turbo models and the high uh, spec models, really just the naturally aspirated ones and the base model ones. So that would be the... 356 moving through to the 911s and the Boxsters. And here, if we look at the weight of Porsches over time, the weight is increasing. It does seem to taper off as time goes on, but there's no real point where we can see that as the years have gone on, they've created lighter cars. This has clearly been driven by the size of the vehicles. The lengths of these cars have increased as time has gone on. So while the size and the weight of these cars has increased, the engineers have increased the power of the engines quite considerably. Now, post the 1990s, it looks like there's almost two lines that have been drawn here. Uh, the top one would indicate the 911s and the bottom one would indicate the Porsche Boxsters that have been included in this data set. Now, this is clearly showing that the engineers at Porsche are able to decide how powerful an engine they're putting in their vehicles. This is far less based on their capabilities of building a more or less powerful engine and more on their choice of which engine is going to suit the car. And so even though the weight has increased, 
the power to weight has managed to increase throughout the years as well. And I think it's data like this that supports the idea that cars are getting heavier as time goes on, rather than the fact that we are incapable of building lightweight cars. It is certainly easier to build a lightweight car today than it is to build a lightweight car in the 1950s. There have been marked improvements to the materials available and the techniques of manufacture. So now that we've had a look at this data, there's a few things that we can apply to our vehicle specifications. Now first, if it hasn't been made clear, I'm intending that the car that we're designing will be a rear wheel drive car. And there's two main reasons for this. One, I don't want the grip of the car and acceleration to be so high that when the driver is releasing the clutch, it's just heading to an engine stall rather than braking traction. And the second is that a four wheel drive system adds quite a lot of weight and complexity to the vehicle. Now, the other thing to consider is that this will be a lightweight car, not a heavy car. Now, the target for weight of this vehicle will be 600 kilos. I would like to go lighter than that, but at the same time, I want to make sure that the vehicle will be able to perform even if it weighs as much as 800 kilos. And the target for the zero to 100 time will be anything under six seconds. And this is in that region that we saw in the power to weight graph of where we see the crossover of the importance of power and the importance of grip. If the car has a power to weight ratio of 0.15, we should reliably be able to get under a six second acceleration time. And that means for a 600 kilogram car, we would need 90 kilowatts. And for an 800 kilogram car, we would need 120 kilowatts. If we move to a power to weight of about 0.2, then that changes to 120 kilowatts for a 600 kilo car and 160 kilowatts for an 800 kilo car. So we're going to specify an engine that has at least 120 kilowatts. Now, if we have a look at the top speed versus power, 120 kilowatts is going to get us around 220 kilometers an hour, which is far more than I'm going to need from this vehicle. This engine should be between one and a half and two and a half liters. And we would expect that the car will have a length less than four meters. So at this point, we can go back to our data set and have a look at the cars that are there that already go under a six second zero to 100 time and are less than four meters in length and preferably something with an engine that of less than two and a half liters and we see the following vehicles and we shouldn't be surprised these vehicles are fairly lightweight cut back simple vehicles the aerial atom a caterham a super seven style uh, vehicle the lancia stratos a lotus elise a ktm expo the alpha uh, 33 a Porsche RS60 and the Jaguar D-Type. And it's cars from this list that can help form benchmarks for this project moving forwards. Now we're going to explore more of these car specifications and some of the reasons why I'm targeting a lightweight 600 kilo car in future videos. But I hope you've enjoyed going through this data. Thanks for your time.